Sashi Dilek and welcome to our FNV podcast, Unsilenced Voices of Young Tibetans. Tibetans today celebrate its 62nd anniversary of the Tibetan Democracy Day. Looking back at its journey from a nascent democracy to an entity now embracing both procedural and structural democracy, we truly treaded uncharted waters then. Fortunately, under the leadership of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, and several charismatic individuals, we Tibetans never capsize and resolutely continue our trust with democracy. In this context, today I would like to welcome our guest. He is a good friend of mine, whom I initially crossed paths during my years in Delhi University, and eventually our relationship blossomed during our year together at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is a spirited individual who has led and been part of various grassroots organizations in our community, including Students for a Free Tibet, the Delhi University Tibetan Student Union, the Tibet Forum JNU, where even I was a member, and now is the president of the National Democratic Party of Tibet. Welcome to our podcast, Tashi Dundullah. Uh, thank you, Dundullah. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, listening or watching the episode. And thank you, Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives, for having me today. So firstly, uh, congrats on your recent <clears throat> elected appointment, whereby you got elected as the president of the National Democratic Party of Tibet by its members. So how do you feel as the president, especially in light of being the youngest president, as far as I know? Uh, actually, from the beginning, I've never thought that I would be elected as a president of National Democratic Party of Tibet. Uh, but uh, given the circumstances, uh, for me, I think I consider this as a very big, uh, important uh, office, which uh, seems being uh, elected by the people. Uh, it also best out the democratic responsibility that I have as a Tibetan citizen. So I took this role as a Tibetan citizen as well as as a democratic duty. Thank you for sharing your experience. But now, can you explain and describe to us all the genesis of the National Democratic Party of Tibet and its relevance now in the ever-evolving democracy practiced by Tibetans in exile? So, uh, if we look back, uh, so the, uh, the very vision of uh, having a political party or the very vision of having National Democratic Party of Tibet was uh, under the directive and vision of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. Uh, His Holiness directed uh, Tibetan Youth Congress, uh, one of the biggest Tibetan non-governmental organization, to form a political party in order to uh, develop a better relation between people and our democratic government so that uh, there will be more people involvement. So from that beginning, uh, and uh, in 1994, in the month of September, uh, September 2nd, National Democratic Party of Tibet was founded uh, by the Tibetan Youth Congress. Uh, so uh, some of our main uh, goals and agendas that we work on are first, the promotion and preservation of uh, democratic polity and Tibet, dem dem democratic political system, and the second is uh, the well-being of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And the third is the, to continue uh, the Tibetan freedom movement. So after that, and we have a series of, uh, so right now it's the ninth Central Executive Committee and uh, each Central Executive Committee can uh, run this office for three years. And uh, I'm the president of ninth uh, Central Executive Committee and uh, so till now, we have been uh, working as a political party as well as, as, well as, uh, as a non-governmental organization. So it's sort of like a semi-political party. Thank you, Tashila. That was really, you know, like for me, someone who didn't know much about political parties in our exiled Tibetan community, it was 
really nice of you sharing the genesis, the coming of the National Democratic Party of Tibet. So moving on, I would like to share an experience regarding democracy, the term democracy. I remember last year how me and a couple of my friends, along with a very prominent Tibetan political leader, were discussing the Tibetan term used for democracy, which is twofold, though it phonetically sounds the same. In Tibetan, we uh, refer to that as mangso, right? And mangso, we have like two words, like in Tibetan, taumangase mangso, meaning the masses, while manga mangso, meaning the majority. The leader who I will not name gave us a very good insight on it and how there were several debates in our exiled Tibetan community on this very term of democracy. What are your thoughts on this? And what is the term, what is the Tibetan term that your party uses for democracy? So for now, we are using manga mang, which means majority. So uh, as it's very clear from our political stand, uh, since being uh, a government, since being since having our uh, central Tibetan administration in exile and not ha not having uh, a nation, uh, using the word taumang as a mang, or the if we translate into masses, uh, using that word uh, makes it a little bit sort of like a, a sort of like drawback for the community because uh, when we talk about taumang as a mang or the masses. We, need, uh, we also talk about, uh, it uh, talks about the inclusivity of many diversity. Like We talk about many positive uh, values that uh, democracy promotes. Right? But uh, since not having a, um, a government, uh, not having a nation, uh, we are not using that word, uh, particularly because uh, when we make decisions uh, in our uh, Central Tibetan administration or in Tibetan diaspora, we make decision decision based on majority only. The the thoughts and the ideas of many of the Tibetans who are in Tibet are not included in our decision making. So, because of that very reason, so I think uh, it's the best uh, uh, time right now to use the word manga mang. But as we proceed uh, into our democratic political system, as we evolve. I'm sure we will reach that uh, point when we can use Taumang, Asyamang, when uh, the Tibetan inside Tibet are also included in our decision-making bodies. Thank you, Tashila. That was really, you know, like, even for me, like, I think I, uh, I can now understand why Tibetans had to really, you know, debate on this very term when we translated it into Tibetan. So thank you for highlighting that. Now, I would like to move more into your personal life, and if permissible from you, can you share your journey from Tibet to India with us? And looking back at it, what are your dwellings on it? Uh, I was born in Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, in the year 1994, according to the documents. And then uh, my old all my parents, uh, they perished under the Chinese Communist regime, under the uh, persecution of uh, People's, People's Liberation Army. Uh, in, the year 2000, in, the, in the year 1999, uh, my grandfather decided uh, that I should be sent to India. And uh, in the, during the month of December, I started my journey from, uh, by crossing the Himalaya. And uh, I reached India in the year 2000, uh, during the month of January. Uh, so since then, I've been studying in uh, Tibetan uh, Children's Village, Upper in Dramsala, and uh, I did my high school there also. So after that, I did my uh, further studies in Delhi University, as uh, Tamdula mentioned before. And then I did my master's in sociology from jo uh, Jawahar Lal Nehru University. So after that, I've been working here in National Democratic Party of Tibet uh, for about almost three years. And uh, so right now, I'm working as a president. Thank you, Dashila. The an interesting thing that I found out since you mentioned your birth is like the National Democratic Party was also formed in the year when you were born, 1995. So that is, I don't know, maybe a coincidence or what you call it. Like, So yeah, it's very, you know, in a way, it's sad that Tibetans have to undergo such journey to experience freedom, democracy, but seeing the results of it, seeing someone like you who has come journeying all the, all the way from the Himalayas and is doing great things right now. 
assures us that the journey was truly worthwhile. Uh, now, yeah, now I would like to just ask you something like, uh, what do you see as your biggest contribution to Tibet and the Tibetan still now, though, even though I know that you have a big life ahead and you certainly are going to do big things, but what is the thing that you see as your biggest contribution right now? So prior to my uh, journey to India, uh, we have this uh, advice from our uh, elders and also from His Holiness that we should, uh, so being in India, like in a free country, we should study, work hard and uh, try to contribute uh, in the cause. So this, is, this has been in my mind the whole time uh, from the beginning. So, uh, uh, and uh, this is the very uh, willpower that, uh, make, that helps me keep going on. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, after coming to India, so I've been trying my best uh, to somehow try to invest my energy or my time into uh, doing something that will help uh, Tibetan people inside Tibet. Definitely. And I remember during our times at JNU how you would, you know, as a Tibetan, as a responsible Tibetan, you would share the story about Tibetans to our very good Indian friends, you know, like yeah, that was itself yeah. a very beautiful contribution, I believe. Yeah. So uh, there's one very thing that uh, I still remember from my times in JNU. So while uh, we were in JNU, so if we look like around JNU on the wall, all walls are all around GNU and every nook and corner of GNU, you'll get to experience how Indian people have struggled, how Indian people have uh, fought for their democratic rights and duties, right? how Indian people have fought for their freedoms. So uh, taking an example of uh, China as well, like you know very well that in 1989, uh, there's a Tiananmen Square massacre where thousands of uh, Chinese students uh, fought for democratic rights and freedoms. right? And also, if you look at Hong Kong, it's the same case. Uh, if we check the Hong Kong umbrella movement, it's a movement begun by the, started by the Hong Kong youths. And uh, so from all these things, what I've come to realize is that uh, those who work for what they want, they know, uh, they know the value of it, right? But uh, given the fact that uh, we are gifted democracy uh, by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the year 1960, uh, none of the Tibetans have fought for democratic rights or democratic freedoms, or in fact for democracy itself. So because of that, many of us are taking it for granted. So this is something that we must realize uh, the, the earlier the better, because uh, the longer we take, we'll, have, we'll surely face more problems in the coming years. So from, from my part of, uh, from my uh, observation, the constitutional crisis that we are facing right now and uh, the government uh, that we have right now, where we have seven departments, but four of the departments are vacant without any minister. So this is a drawback that we have because of uh, our uh, Tibetan people taking democratic rights and duties, democracy itself as it granted. So this is something that uh, we must realize and we must act upon it. Yes, yes. Thank you for you know updating us on the current status of Tibetans practicing democracy. You know there are certain elements that we must definitely improve upon if we are really to cherish the gift of democracy that His Holiness has empowered upon us Tibetans. So thank you very much, Tashi. Uh, now, like. Uh, since we have talked a bit about your personal life, I would like to get back to the subject of democracy. And like uh, the question that I would like to ask is, what does the political parties of our exiled Tibetan community have to offer? As I personally have not seen any major movements from the non-recognized political parties by CTA, be it the People's Party of Tibet formed in 2011, the Tibetan National Congress in 2013, the National Rangsin Party of Tibet, formed by Jamyang Nupu, or even the erstwhile Tibetan Communist Party formed in 1979. And there might be many more, which I honestly am not aware of. So what are your thoughts on this, Tashi? Uh, 
So for now, we have, uh, it's, uh, if you look at the documents of the Central Tibetan Administration, it's only National Democratic Party of Tibet that's uh, being recognized by the Central Tibetan Administration uh, as a political party as well as a non-governmental organization. Uh, other than that, we don't have, uh, though, like if you look into academia papers, uh, you will get to see that there are like numbers of other political parties like Tibetan National Congress, Tibetan uh, People's Party, and uh, Tibetan Communist Party as well. But uh, for now, we don't have any, uh, these parties are not recognized by the Central Tibetan Administration, uh, but uh, as proposed by the, proposed in the uh, ninth uh, general body meeting of the National Democratic Party of Tibet, uh, having a democratic polity, having a political party is very much necessary because uh, looking back into the democracy itself, so it began from uh, Greece, and uh, if you, the democracy, it was introduced in Tibetan uh, polity very lately, like it's been only uh, six decades, right? So uh, if you look, even if you look at India, uh, it's very clear that uh, during the early stage of India's uh, independence, uh, even J. J. Prakash Narayan uh, also proposed a partyless uh, democracy in India. So uh, the the idea of non-partisan uh, uh, democracy, if you look at, at a broader view of uh, the world, there are very few countries that practice uh, partyless democracy. Uh, some of which are like uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia. So where uh, the current uh, ruling governments are very, very conservative. So as proposed, as I mentioned before, as proposed in the ninth uh, Central uh, Executive General Body Meeting, uh, we are in attempt, uh, we are in uh, approach uh, to uh, enhance the democratic uh, political system uh, based on a party-based political system. So somehow we are in, uh, try, we will engage with other political parties, like you mentioned, Tibetan People's Party and Tibetan National Congress. Somehow we need these parties to, to, de to transform our fledging uh, democratic system into uh, full-fledged uh, democratic polity. Yes, sir. So what you're mentioning, mentioning and stating is like Tibetans need to adhere to a multi-party system that is, which is completely different from what China is. China is a single party yes. government. Right? So how do you go forth with this uh, multi-party system? We know that as even I mentioned and you reiterated the fact that there are various other parties, right? So how would this be integrated to the grassroots levels in our exile democratic entity? So first thing that uh, we need to have is like, uh, we need to have uh, a CTA and uh, its office barriers to have a broader concept of uh, why we need polit political party in our democratic system. So they need to understand because of now we, for now we have uh, individuals, uh, Sikyongs uh, and uh, Kalins uh, standing for political posts and uh, the way they, uh, they contest election, it's uh, somehow becoming undemocratic sometimes. Because uh, if you look at 2021's uh, election, we have uh, Tibetan uh, leaders, uh, candidates for Sikyong who don't participate in electoral debates, which I felt is very undemocratic. And so even in like uh, any democratic system, like be it like uh, a single bi bi-party system or many party system, or even if there's like one party, they need, they need, to, they need to have a, a uh, have a debate like all the candidates need, need to have has to have a debate and uh, people need to know like what the le what leaders uh, they are like uh, voting for right so um, having like not we uh, having like our uh, political leaders not participating in uh, public debates and democratic discourse it's uh, i think it's a it's a drawback and it's also a fact of having not political party uh, in our uh, having and not uh, not not allowing political party to engage into our electoral system. Definitely, I think the election commission, in, to be more specific, should you know make things clear before these steps are taken, before the election happens, before the ballots are cast. You know, this is a very you know very significant thing that we Tibetans must change and yes, change for better. Yes. 
Yes, Damdila, thank you for shedding light on this uh, particular topic. So since uh, prior to, uh, after Dalai Lama uh, best out uh, his political responsibility to democratically elected leader, uh, since uh, during 2011, uh, we used a National Democratic Party of Tibet. At that time, we used to act as a political party and we used to uh, uh, engage in with people like by uh, organizing like uh, democratic debates, uh, talks, and also workshops. Uh, various uh, settlement Tibetan uh, Tibet, Tibetan settlement across uh, India. So uh, so since two thousand seventeen, <laughs> uh, we had this uh, elect uh, electoral uh, uh, regulations amendment, uh, especially by the during the sixteenth Tibetan Parliament. There is a like. Uh, a series of uh, electoral amendments uh, by the Tibetan Electoral Review Committee uh, chaired by uh, Kasur uh, Karma Ishila, who was the then uh, Minister of uh, Department of Finance. So uh, during that, uh, during that, between that amendment, it was decided that uh, no political party or non-governmental organization is allowed to propose any candidates. But uh, they are not very clear with uh, the other regulations, because of which uh, in 2021, though we proposed to host uh, and organize an electoral debate, but uh, the election commission uh, specifically uh, is mentioned that uh, we are not allowed to carry out such uh, or activities, but uh, it was not mentioned into the uh, like uh, Tibetan uh, electoral regulations. So uh, this somehow shows that uh, this, we still need to work on our uh, electoral regulations and we also need to uh, have a member of parliaments more aware of such issues so that these discussions will come up into Tibetan parliament. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. I definitely support what you say. Like we need some educated and much needed reforms in our elected system, you know? So the next question that I would pose is something based on your own self. Like I did my own a bit of research on the National Democratic Party of Tibet, and I have become aware of how the past presidents of your party have been prominent members in the legislative body of our Tibetan government in exile, which is currently known as the Tibetan parliament in exile. So would you like to follow your predecessors and be part of that very legis legislative body in the near future, Tashi? Uh, definitely, definitely. That's uh, one of my goal. And uh, though, like uh, like I mentioned before, my prior goal, primary goal is to make a difference into lives of Tibetan people inside Tibet. So in order to do that, we need uh, Tibetan people in Tibetan diaspora need to act on those things, uh, things which could improve the living standard, which could improve the uh, situation inside uh, Tibet. So in order to... Uh, uh, put out my thoughts into our Tibetan diaspora, I need to represent uh, and our thoughts uh, need to be represented in the uh, Tibetan parliament. So, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it would be my pleasure to be uh, part of the Tibetan parliament in the future if I, if I get elected. Definitely. That is a very commendable aspiration you have, and I wish you well on that. Thank you, thank you so moving forward, like as we mentioned before, and you even you said that again, like how we Tibetans celebrate today as a democracy day, but it all started in 1960, you know, when the elected members of the first Tibetan legislative body took their oath at Bodh Gaya in the presence of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. How do you view these past six decades of democracy practiced by us Tibetans since that fateful day? Uh, the very principle that uh, democracy is by the government, for the government, of the government. Uh, we people, uh, we Tibetan people have uh, uh, have been facing challenges understanding the concept, these concepts. So uh, when uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama best out uh, the political responsibility to democratically elected leaders, uh, it's uh, not the responsibility of uh, our elected leaders, but uh, 
we should understand that the responsibility comes to Tibetan people. It's uh, so like, uh, like I mentioned before, the concept of by the people, for the people and of the people. So whatever is happening inside uh, Central Tibetan administration and whatever decision making, uh, uh, whatever decision that they are making, it's uh, in the end, it comes to us, the people. So though like Central Tibetan administration is, uh, is here in Dramsala and we have Tibetan people scattered all over the world, there's a huge gap, be gap between Tibetan people and the Central Tibetan administration. So somehow the National Demo Democratic Party of Tibet for now, we are trying to act as a bridge between people and the government by uh, organizing various talks and uh, uh, democratic uh, talks, uh, awareness talks, uh, educating people uh, through democratic uh, awareness campaigns. So, um, yeah, somehow uh, we are we still there's still a space to improve. Like, and uh, in the coming years, we will uh, engage more with people by organizing more talks and campaigns or discussion debates. So I hope that there will be more engagement from the general public as well, especially from the youth. Yeah, that was you know like very nice of you. Not only yourself, but your party of being the bridge between the Tibetans who are in a way stranded or isolated from the central Tibetan administration, isolated in the sense that they are not being able to get in touch with them, though the CTA remains ever present. So that is a very nice initiative and I hope it becomes successful because we need more such initiatives in our community. So yeah, Dashila, yeah, so before you have anything to say or? Uh... Oh, so okay. For now, like like I mentioned before, this is just a reminder for all the people, especially Tibetans listening uh, the episode. Uh, like I mentioned before, if we are very privileged to be gifted this democracy. So on this uh, 60, uh, 62nd uh, Tibetan Democracy Day, if I'm not wrong, so I wish uh, that we Tibetan uh, start to be more responsible and uh, I'm I know that we are very, whenever there's like democratic rights, we are always there to you know, practice our rights. But uh, when it comes to duties, many, very few uh, people uh, try to complete their duties. So somehow it's my message and it's my request to general public that we need to engage more into our political system we cannot say that uh, uh, this thing, this concept of oh, I hate politics, our oh, politics is so annoying, this stuff. We need to understand that being a refugee or being in exile, our existence itself is a polit uh, politics. So uh, we must engage more into uh, our Tibetan political developments. Uh, so in future, I hope to see more uh, participation from general public. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, like there is the famous saying in uh, like being a political science student, like the personal is political, you know. So yes, yes. I think that was one point that you was emphasizing. So you have already shared your message to our Tibetan sisters and brothers, but do you have any messages to our? You know, we Tibetans are lucky to have such a huge number of supporters, be it individuals, organizations. So do you have any message in particular to them? Uh... There's one message in particular uh, called, uh, about, about the Tibetan freedom movement uh, that I would like to emphasize, emphasize here. Uh, uh, I would like to share an experience. Like, during one of my uh, our, uh, signature campaigns, I was collecting people's signature uh, around uh, Meklod Ganj, and uh, I've met a foreigner. So I remember telling him that uh, I need his signature because uh, we are advocating for freedom and uh, restoration of uh, Tibetan people's uh, right and uh, to fight against the persecution of Tibetan people. So he told me that he knows everything about Tibetans, be it, all, uh, like, uh, be, be it like we are deprived of, uh, deprived of the human rights uh, or like uh, religious uh, rights or like everything. So be it like Tibetan being murdered like every now and then in Tibet. So he's aware of everything. Beside that, he told me that he will not sign the paper. 
so I I remember telling him that uh, he must have his own point, so we can debate over it, right? And he told me like, look around, do your people look like uh, do 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 the Tibetans in uh, exile? Do we look like uh, such things are going on in Tibet, like the murders, the kidnappings, the uh, what do I say, like? everything so for for now like it's uh, according to international freedom house we know that uh, tibet is one of the least free country on the on the on the world in the world so uh, uh just carrying a, a picture of dalai lama could la could land you for years in prison or some in some case could you could you you could get murdered for that so uh, i remember telling uh, he, he he told me that like uh, we Tibetan people in uh, exile don't reflect uh, our actions and our like uh, voice or whatever we do. We don't reflect like the Tibetan people are going through such situation. So we need to act, uh, uh, put stronger action uh, in the coming year rather than talking about uh, like uh, democracy, human rights, and all those stuffs. We need to act upon it. So I think it's time to act and. Uh, for me, I'll not take democracy for granted. I'll not take my freedom for granted. I know that uh, as much as I am privileged uh, to, uh, to, be, to be able to exercise those freedom, I'm sure that Tibetan people inside Tibet also deserve that same freedom, also deserve that same human rights. So when, with that understanding, I'm, uh, I request that Tibetan people like from all walk of life, be it like uh, uh, male, female, or of any gender of, or, or of any age, we should act. We should start acting upon our like uh, uh, goals that uh, that is to free Tibet and free Tibetan people from the persecution of uh, persecution of the Chinese Communist regime. So it's time to act. I'll not take democracy for granted, and it's uh, yeah. I I call upon the Tibetan people all over the world to act. Let's uh, let's start the new generations, right? Yeah, definitely. That was a very beautiful, not beautiful, I would say, like an interesting anecdote that you had to share how we, due to the actions of our exiled Tibetan community and individuals here, we are in a way losing support from international communities. So that is a very interesting point. And I believe like, I believe what you say that we Tibetans should do more, you know, act more, fulfill your duties, see what is there on the other side. So I think with this, we would like to end and I would like to thank Tashi Tundublao for being our guest today. Your insights personally as an individual and as a president of the National Democratic Party of Tibet made me aware of many developments in our Tibetan community, but furthermore, really pushed the notion and the envelope that states Tibetan youths are truly the future of Tibet. Thank you. Thank you so much. So tired of